up, everybody? This is LA Knight, and I am finally back with a review of Beasts Made of Night by Tochi Onyebuchi. Now, the reason I haven't been, uh, sorry, there's gonna be a lot of pausing because I'm highly medicated and my face hurts. Not just from my allergies, but because of my dentist. I went to the dentist! My mom is, like, a freak about my teeth, and... She says my teeth are tacky, and she wants them to not be tacky, so she is forking over money to take me to the dentist to make my teeth not tacky anymore. Which means my mouth hurts a lot, even with ibuprofen. Anyway. So, I'm here with my review for- ow. For Beast Made of Night by Tochi Onyebuchi. Now- this is Tochi Onyebuchi's debut novel, so I'd never read anything by him before. I actually thought he was a woman for a long time, because at the same time that I heard about Beasts Made of Night, which is inspired by Nigerian mythology and written by Tochi Onyebuchi, I heard of Children of Blood and Bone by Tomi Adiyemi, who's a woman, which is also inspired by Nigerian mythology. And so I kept mixing them up. And I thought both of them were ladies, and then I found out about a month before I got the book that no, Tochi Onyebuchi's a dude, and uh, and he was actually really chill about it because I found I tweeted about it, and I'm bad at Twitter, and so I accidentally tagged him in the tweet, and was like, how did I spend you know X number of months not knowing that this guy that this guy was a guy? And he was like, no, nah, no, nah, it's all it's all cool, it's cool, fam. I'm like, oh, he's talking to me. Um, he was super nice about it. I've seen a lot of his Twitter posts. He's really nice, just out in general. He just seems like a really great guy. And he, uh, his book is really interesting. Um, I ended up listening to it on audiobook. I got my local library to order the Overdrive audiobook for me because I don't have time to read like actually sit and hold a book and read it now because I have no job <laughs> and uh and so since I have no job I'm busy looking for for work and dealing with all the things involved with the fact that I have no job like unemployment and trying to deal with food stamps here's here's an annoying quick side note just because I feel like bitching about this for two seconds so I finally after Three months. I started the application process in October and finally in January got approved for food stamps. I have to renew my application by the end of this month. I don't know why. Just because. I guess. They're supposed to give you at least four months. But I guess not. Whatever. Anyway. That's just a little side note of annoyance. So I listened to the audiobook, and I think I've heard from some people that they had a little bit of trouble getting into the book, that there was a lot of, um, not really so much exposition, but more just, like, setting up of the world, and that people said that that took a while longer than they wanted it to. And I can totally see that, because the, this, the book, it's the first in at least a duology, if not a, uh, a trilogy. The book is inspired by Nigerian mythology, and the thing is, there aren't very many um, pieces of media that are inspired by that mythos, and we don't, you know, we kids in America, I say kids even though I'm like almost 30, god, ugh, we readers in America, you know, for the most part, don't know too much about, you know, cultures like, uh, like, Niger Ni Nigeria. Like, I don't know anything about Nigeria other than I think it's in West Africa and that um, the Orishas of, of the Santeria religion are part of their mythology. That's all I know. And actually, I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure about that. So, I can understand why the author, being a Nigerian-American, working with a an audience who has not experienced 
this culture before in the same way that we've been really overexposed to uh, to Western European medieval culture, you know, castles and knights and kings and queens and all that. Um, I could see why he would have to really extrapolate um, and, and, and explain and really set the stage because, like, you know, the, the mental, like, the cult, the cultural identity is different, and, and slipping into that cultural, cultural identity as the reader can be difficult for us, and so it's, it makes it easier when you have an open mind, if the author does a lot of the work for you. I found it very interesting. I mean, I felt I like I a lot of the stuff I didn't know. I wouldn't have known if he had just like said it, like named a thing and then been like, "Yeah, I saw this thing." Okay, now moving on. I would have been like, "Wait, what? What is like the cultural significance of that? Like, why is this important? Why is this relevant to the plot? Like, how does this work? What does this do?" Like, you know, with 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 medieval Western European cultures and and social norms you can kind of intuit how things sort of flow into into each other because we've been so overexposed to it um in in media in fantasy media but we don't have that benefit with fantasy that takes place in other locations anyway i usually start off my reviews with a summary but i forgot because i was talking about that um so the book is about this boy named Taj, and he is an Aki, and an Aki is someone who eats other people's sins, and there's, like, spells that, that mages do to draw the sin out of a person, and it becomes a sin beast, and then the Aki fight the sin beast, and then the sins, and then they eat, like, once the sin is, sin beast is killed... It turns into, like, this noxious black crap, and they eat it. Like, it forces itself down their throat, and then it leaves a tattoo behind. And Taj is one of the best of the Aki in the capital city, of course. And so he gets called to eat the sin of a prince, but then he gets called back to eat another sin. It's assumed that it's, like, I'm pretty sure it's the sin of the king, but it has something to do with the sin that the prince had him eat earlier. And it's like, because he managed to eat both of them, I guess, like, he now, because he can see the actual sin being committed, he, um, like, now the guards are like, oh, well, he has seen the sin, so now we have to kill him to, you know, to, to stop him from, like, blabbing to whoever. And the thing is, is that the king... Um, the, the, what it is is I guess like the king has to be blameless in order to rule so the king can do all kinds of horrible shit but then the Aki just eat his sins and so he's considered pure and it's an interesting it's an interesting look at culpability and who gets the blame for what and classism and prejudice it's, it's really interesting Sorry, I'm sucking on a cough drop. It's really interesting. And, um... I, uh... Like, I bought it. I actually pre-ordered it because I wanted to make sure, make sure, make sure that my money went into furthering diverse books and diversity from the big five publishing houses for YA. Um, I made sure to, to pre-order it, but then, because I got fired uh, from my job, like, a month before the book came out, so when it arrived, I didn't have time to read it because I was busy doing things and this was before um, I had access to Overdrive so I couldn't listen to it because the library wouldn't get it on Audio CD because I don't think it existed on Audio, C Audio CD it's only for digital audiobook and so I was like shoot and so I kept like trying to make time to read this book and I just didn't have the time and I felt so bad and then I saw in an interview that Toshi Onyabuchi had had written this book inspired by the way that black people in American culture get the blame for so much, even things that aren't their fault. I mean, it's, rather, especially for things that aren't their fault. 
And he really wanted to explore, like, that concept of blaming people for things that aren't their fault because of circumstances that are also beyond, you know, beyond their control and not their fault. And how that can shape a society and corrupt a government and stuff. And I was like, shit, I really need to read this book, damn it! But then I just, I just didn't have time. But then finally I got, I got, um, Overdrive, and so I could do it that way. And that was really great. Um, so, you know... I really liked Taj. He's a good kid. His life sucks. Um, the only thing I didn't like was that, although there are a lot of female characters in the in the book, the only two who really get any real uh, text time are this young uh, mage in training and the princess. And the spoilers... Spoilers, 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 spoilers. The princess is batshit crazy. And, uh... And she's like the... She... She's like every evangelical priest preacher I've ever seen on TV, minus the part where they swindle you for money. But the part where, you know, like, um... Oh, better example. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen The Waltons. Probably not. Because it came out in the 60s. My mom used to watch it, though. Um, because it really reflected her family life. And so that's how me and my brother got into it is because my mom watched it. And so she would, she showed it to us. And, uh, in one episode of the Waltons, it takes place in the twenties and thirties, you know, before or during the great depression. And during one episode, the town gets a new preacher and he ends up staying with the Waltons because he doesn't have a, uh, have a home yet. Cause they're in the middle of building his house. Or something. And so he's practicing preaching in the yard and he's preaching at the younger children. And he's saying things like, yes, you are putrid and you, and God hates you because you are full of sin and you are condemned to hell if you don't repent. And the kids are like, like the youngest, the youngest of the kids is like five. During this episode, she wakes up in the middle of the night because of this event and goes running into her parents' room because she had a nightmare that the devil was chasing her. Like, it's terrible. But that's what the princess is like. She's like, you know, everyone in the city is evil, and they need to repent. And so her whole grandmaster plan is that she is going to summon these mythical beings who are basically going to lay waste to the city because it's so full of sin. And, and she pulls it off, too! Like, that's the thing. It's like, the, the I didn't realize that this was a duology, or at least, if not a trilogy. I thought it was a standalone. So, color me shocked as fuck when the book ends with Taj and his friends escaping the city while it's being smashed to pieces by these monsters from the sky. I was like, holy shit, what the fuck is happening right now? And then I was like, wait, there's only ten minutes left on this audiobook. Shit, 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 no! Oh, it was the worst thing. Uh, I was just like, I like laid there and stared at my ceiling. And I was supposed to be um, filling out a form, and I, but I had to stop. And I was just like, I'm dead. Ah. Oh, it was the worst thing. I was like, no. Uh. The book is so good, though. Like, oh my gosh. Like, I can understand, like, the thing is, you have to go into the book with the mindset that this is not going to read like your typical high fantasy, because the author, because he's working with a culture that most people don't have experience with, he has to lay all of this groundwork. Like, he has to. I mean, it's one thing if it's, like, Egyptian mythology or Greek mythology or, you know, even Norse mythology has had its heyday, right? But, um... But Nigerian mythology, like, I can only think of two books, and this is one of them, that have Nigerian mythology as, like, the, the, the kickoff point for the plot. And it's this one, and then Children of Blood and Bone, which isn't out yet. So, you know, I can see why he had to take some time to, to lay those foundations. And so going into the book, like, people need to keep in mind he had to lay these foundations in order for people to really... Um, really focus and or not focus but really get like immersed in the world 
But then because of that, the plot is a little slow at the beginning. Also, it's 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 very politicky. Um, you know, it's very political in that there's like you know backstabbing and intrigue and 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 the politics of the book, of the world itself, um, play a major that play a major role in the plot. But Taj doesn't care about politics. So, you know, it is a little, it can be a little hard to follow because he's taken by surprise so often because he doesn't know what's happening. And he's also, he's really angry, which, you know, understandable. I mean, he's an Aki and he's treated like shit, even though he does, you know, work for people. It's, yeah, it's just, it's a really interesting book. It's a really interesting concept. I almost died when I got to the end because I didn't know it was a cliffhanger. Totsu Onyabuchi is really, really nice. I am definitely planning on reading his next book, even if it's not the sequel to Beast Made of Night, and it better be. Otherwise, I will die. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, this is just a short little review to try to get back into the swing of things. Um, I, you know, I'm gonna try to do at least two reviews a, uh, two reviews a week. Because now that I have the ability to use Overdrive, I'm reading a lot more because I have time to read, to listen to audiobooks while I'm doing stuff. Which is great. So yeah, um, you know, hit the like button if you love me, subscribe for more of me, and, you know, check me out on, you know, my social media and all that, which is linked down below. I'm on, let's see if I can remember this because I don't have my, my list in front of me. I'm on Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, obviously, uh, Patreon, Pinterest, mm, let's see, Patreon, Pinterest, fanfiction.net, archive of our own, filmfiction.net, fictionpress.com, Wattpad, uh, hmm, I know I'm missing some, oh, I'm on Instagram now, and I can't think of any more. And, you know, support me on Patreon, you know, that would be great, especially since I'm unemployed right now. (laughs) Help me. Help me. Help me. And, um, shout out to my patrons, Lorian, Whitney, Belle, Chelsea, Cynthia, Tina, Lena, (laughs) Lori, did I say Lorian? I think I said Lorian. Monsieur Foxy, and the thing is, I don't have my list in front of me either. Wait, that was everyone, wasn't it? That was Bell. Oh shoot. Uh. See, the other thing is, is I'm recovering from the flu, so my brain's not firing on all cylinders. I'm a terrible person. I love you guys, though. I know that is that is everyone. Anna, Anna, Belle, Chelsea, Cynthia, Lorian, Whitney, Lena, Tina, Monsieur Foxy, and Morgan. Yeah, that's everyone. That's nine people. So yeah, love you guys. Sorry that I couldn't remember right off the top of my head. I'm still recovering. I'm so sorry. I'm super drugged. My face hurts, and I'm recovering from the flu. My life sucks in some ways. I mean, it could be worse. I do know that it could be worse. (sighs) But I do love, I love my patrons, and I love my subscribers. Thank you guys for subscribing to me on YouTube. And seriously, go check out this book, because it is really good, and we want to support diverse authors so we can, you know, show the, the big five publishing companies that diverse books do sell so that they'll start printing more of them instead of assuming that it's a niche market. Alright, talk to you guys later, and remember, you are loved. Also, I think I'm going to go fall unconscious now. Goodbye!